Warning, Star Trek from the holodeck contains adult language and discussions. If you're easily offended, do not continue to listen. Walk it alone! Fire. Holodeck 3 program is reinstated. Open sesame! Commander Klingon vessel. We are energizing transport of him. Now. Welcome, everyone, to Star Trek from the Holodeck. I am Michael Flores, your captain. And in the studio with me is Lower Decks Officer at Anson, the shittiest of all shittiest Jeez. officers, David. Do I get the at least some cybernetic implants, mm, something? Nope. You get nothing. I get nothing. Now go back to the Lower Decks. Go ahead. Productivity will be better, though. No. <laughs> All right, welcome everyone to Star Trek from the Holodeck, courtesy of Rain Man Digital. And if you're listening to us live on our RM channel 001 channel on TuneIn, thank you. We will be live as much as possible for the next several weeks talking Star Trek, because of course we have lower decks. Yeah. Star Trek Discovery, just around the corner. And if you want in on that live fun Text RMD69 to 81257, and you will receive push notifications when an RMD show, this one included, is about to go live. This is the Lower Decks edition. All right, so we're going to be talking about Season 1, Episode 3, Temporal Edict, directed by Bob Suarez and written by David Ethenfeld and David Wright. An episode, David, so complicated and intricate, they needed two writers to tackle this script. <laughs> Apparently. Apparently. Yeah. Unbelievable. I mean, it was just so filled. Filled with substance. Yeah. <laughs> two writers. I'm surprised they didn't add a third. This explains a couple of things. <laughs> All right. If, you, if, if our listeners can't uh, guess what our thoughts are on it. This episode was a bit of a step up. It was. It seemed a little more focused on a central idea, at least. Uh, when watching and talking track, you've got to look for those moments of subtext and substance. That's usually how we start our initial breakdown. After it's all said and done, and we watch that episode, we never say, oh, look at that awesome explosion or that awesome visual effects. We say, what was the Star Trek aspect of this? Yes. What is the episode really saying? Yeah. Besides focusing on progressing the plot, what statement is being made? And I will say that for the first time in three episodes, Lower Decks did, in fact, have something they were trying to say. It did. It did. And it is, do not blindly follow rules. Yes. And this is a bit of a Trek thing. And that's why I say this episode is a step up from the previous two. At least there was a semblance of Star Trek there. Yeah. Various moments throughout Trek where logic and or empathy dictates a decision that must be made. And that's why the aspect of blinding, blindingly follow, blindingly, I can't talk, Dave. <laughs> Blindingly following rules is a good statement or question to pose. Is this something you should do? Oh, well, like in Star Trek, the word protocol is always thrown around. Right. That is something that has always followed Star Trek when it comes to a narrative is following Federation protocols. Mm -hmm. Right. And I like the fact that basically in, in this particular episode, they bring this up. Kind of wondering why they basically just shit on the idea, <laughs> but. Well, I think they were trying to show that you don't follow rules blindingly. Blinding. Like, hey, listen, you need to ask questions. You need to have a mind of your own. And I feel like various iterations of Star Trek have, in fact, used this. For example, the Prime Directive. Yeah. The Federation's number one guiding principle. 
How many you times don't have people broken it. <laughs> exactly. You don't interfere with lesser cultures or underdeveloped cultures for various reasons. We already know why. Yeah. And yet when you scroll through all the various Star Trek episodes, you can find moments where every single one of our captains and crew have in fact been guilty of this. And that's because typically they had found a reason why it would be okay to interfere. Again, not following rules blindly. For example, just because this episode is very fresh in my mind, the TNG episode, season two, episode 15, Pin Pals, where Data completely undermines the Prime Directive Protocols or guiding principles to rescue, save the life of a young child. He communicates with her through radio channels and tells her that everything will be okay, even though her world is being destroyed by, I believe, I believe it was earthquakes and volcanoes. It was going yeah, through the I planet. It was so. going through like some type of evolution. And in all actuality, that species probably should have been wiped out. That would have been the natural course of evolution, right? Yes. Data broke those protocols, broke the prime directive. And if he had just blindly followed rules, his empathy never would have taken root. And he would not have saved this child, the species and the family and him and Picard both willingly did just that save the family. Yeah. And it it would be, again, it would hurt the characteristics of data growing at that point because the whole point of data as a character is learning empathy right learning what it means to be human human yeah so go ahead i'm sorry and like i i really do think that they were on to something here going back to episode three of lower decks because i do see that element that you brought up is like not blindingly just saying well we can't break the prime directive and showing that as parallel to like Bulmer. Like, it, it, it is, works. by the way, Boilermer. Boilermer? Yeah, I listened very carefully. It is, he is pronouncing it just, just like that. Boilermer. Yeah, it's not because I thought it was Boilermer originally, and you had said, no, Boilermer. What'd you say? Bulmer. Bulmer. But it is Boilermer. It's a very, very strange word. But, <laughs> and then again, this is a very strange series. <laughs> so but it works for Boilermer because mm-hmm. like that's what makes his uh, makes his characteristics tick. Well, he's the most Federation character of all of all. <laughs> he is. And I think that's why I enjoyed the fact that they used him to highlight that that bit. And yes, we are possibly reaching a bit. But it was a statement that was made at the end of the episode. Mike McMahon and his writers purposely wanted to bring attention to that aspect in their own comedic way, in a very superficial, fast paced way. They gave us that classic Trek ending where there was a bit of a a moral at the end. Yes. And that's the part that I enjoyed about this episode. The beauty of the Trek universe is that humanity is supposed to be operating at an evolved level where we can rely on our own instincts when need be. When you allow protocol and rules to dictate, you're no longer thinking like an evolved species. Species, You're thinking like a machine. Yeah. Plus, there's a philosophical angle to all of this as well. We can look at history to see what happens when those of us have just simply followed rules blindly. Genocide, murder, being complicit based on following orders makes you just as guilty. Yeah. So there was a point. There was a question. There was a philosophical angle. I did like this aspect because it felt like Star Trek. And the, and the thing the thing about it, too, is the fact they used it on every single character. The problem that I've, always, I've had with Lower Decks up to this point is, like, it's a scattershot in the first <laughs> two episodes where it's like they shoot – all their ideas and see what sticks here. They shot a big sticky load (laughs) and it just went everywhere. Yeah. Except the target. Yeah. (laughs) 
here at least they got close to the target because right. they were they were they were trying to get the load at least on the bullseye. Right. In a sea of whys. <laughs> In the in the sea in the, in the sea of what? Let me try to find a best way to say this. In a sea of whys, so far in the in the last three episodes, we're like, why though? That, why? why? Oh. Well, Here's our one percent track, and I salute you, Mike McMahon, for yeah. finally giving us that one percent of track. Amen. Because like, just I like the <laughs> that fact. Sounds so douchey. It, it it does, but it's the honest well, truth. Well, listen, we're Trek fans, yeah. and we're very douchey. So <laughs> deal with it, McMahon. And Welcome like, to the fandom, my friend. And like, there is a way of, unfortunately, Star Trek. You have to understand the type of narrative that you're going to give us yeah. as Star Trek fans. And, and Dave, I'm hoping this is the the tip of the iceberg. I'm hoping that he continues to do things like this, that yeah. it's a bit of a slow burn. He probably should have started this early on, but Hey, episode three, not too late. It's not too late. Not too late. No. That, but the question becomes is like, okay, where do you go from here? What? Yeah. We've that we is said the it, question. We have said this question since episode one, because it is honestly how you write a good Star Trek story is asking yourself, what is this about? What is it about? At I least, honestly wish, Dave, they would take themselves a little more serious. I know this is a you comedy. Can see it. You could see it in this episode that they kind of almost do, except for certain characters ruining it. <laughs> right. We won't say any names. Mariner. Mariner. <laughs> and I swear to God, I, I, I want her dead. <laughs> can, the, can the Borg just enter the show and assimilate her and let us be done with this character? <laughs> I, I mean, I'll be honest. Please, David, be honest. Don't lie to us. The first we don't like liars. Half of the show. I literally wanted to fast forward every time Mariner yeah. showed up. Dave, I don't disagree. Mariner <sighs> continues to just irritate. Yeah. She is just so well, perfect. N- so perfect. For, forget perfect, Dave. Yeah, I agree. But just forget that. She's just so relentlessly annoying. <laughs> I I want to like her, but she's just so blatantly toxic and disrespectful about everything. Yeah. And there's no redeeming qualities. What None. in three episodes, what redeems any of this? What justifies any of these actions? And because we have been given characters that have unbecoming qualities yes. for a very long time. Let's look at Quark, for example, from Deep Space Nine. One of the most despicable characters. Selfish. Selfish, <laughs> sexist, disgusting, perverse, but also amazing. <laughs> exactly. They managed to make this character who is on paper unlikable, but they make him likable. They give him redeeming qualities. He's loving. He is just. He's not as selfish as he appears at face value. He's not even as sexist as he appears on face value. Yeah. He's actually a very liberal Ferengi. That's what makes him charming. He isn't an asshole. And if you're his friend, he's actually very loyal to you. Uh, yes. That's a good example of a character like Mariner, but with redeeming qualities. Now, yes, Mariner isn't sexist and, and all those things. But again, Mariner's a douche. <laughs> you, Mariner is written in a way that you shouldn't like her on paper. You shouldn't like her. And on screen, you don't like her. There's nothing. Tell me, Dave, one thing about her that's likable. Yeah. At this point, just and, try to tell me one thing, Dave, something is there. There was one time in this episode that all of a sudden Mariner became kind of funny when I'm she said say, she was into ransom. Yes, yeah, uh, yeah. that kind of had me chuckling. Well, okay. not, not flat out laughing, just basically going, OK, now we're seeing a now we're seeing a crack in the in the. uh personality of mariner yeah but that was that because of her or because of ransom (laughs) that that that's a very valid point because ransom was freaking awesome why is she like this dave why would anyone write a character like this i've mentioned i mentioned this in the first two episodes and i never really wanted to discuss about it because i want to give mcmahon the benefit of the doubt 
I want to give him the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. Mariner, at this point, episode three, Mariner is his version of Rick in the Star Trek universe. Uh, okay. All right. Now, here's the thing. Hold on. Now, what I want to tell people is the reason why it works for Rick. Okay, go ahead. But not Mariner. Uh-huh. Rick is flawed. Rick is an alcoholic. Rick, from day one, we know Rick is like this really broken character who's an alcoholic who is obviously a super genius, but he has issues. Mariner, they don't show any flaws in her. They don't show any anything wrong with her personality. And that's... It's not just the flaws, Dave. I don't mind having a character that's perfect, even though it's... No, I take that back. I do mind. It's it's not interesting, as we it's said in our last discussion. But I feel like you're on the right track here, but you haven't quite hit on the target. Now, I do hate to continue to have to go back to Rick and Morty, but it does make sense for yes. this specific example here. Mike McMahon is a writer on or was a writer on Rick and Morty. But unfortunately, you can see the element right there. Right. We have to use Rick as a comparison, for example. For just a minute here. Rick is annoying at times. Yes. And extremely toxic. Much Absolutely. like. Very much like Mariner. Yeah. But there's a purpose to it. His arrogance and the superiority complex are coping mechanisms. <laughs> From the exactly. very first episode, you get that he loves his family in his own way. And yeah. he needs them. His codependency is one of his charming aspects. So all of his flaws are not really flaws. They're ways to help you crack through this complex that he has that you find out that he's not really these things. These are coping mechanisms. These are protective shields he put over his person to protect himself from emotions showing because he's broken. Yeah. Mariner has none of this. None of it. Mariner's just annoying to be annoying. And and the sad part is we had the uh, a chance in this episode to see a reason of one of her flaw a reason of her personalities with with the fact that you're dealing with her we finally get to see Captain Freeman yeah her mom actually being a captain and i and the sad part is why are we I not getting see, the connection between them yeah how are we in two episodes later we still don't have them connecting in a personal Sense. sense rick and morty is a family show and no hold on it's not a family show <laughs> i was about to say it's about let me rephrase that it's a it's about a family it's about a family it's actually yeah. about the bonds of family it's about the love of family it's about the loyalty of family it's about family taking precedence over everything else yeah the universe the multiverse doesn't matter you in front of me, my family is what matters. I will destroy a thousand universes Versus. to protect you. Yeah. And like, why are we not getting that personal intimate level? And the reason why is because Mike McMahon should not have been associated with Rick and Morty. And I'm already saying this three episodes in. Yes. The reason why is because he was simply someone who was hired on to do the show. He was not the showrunner. He wasn't the main creative mind behind rick and marty and i feel like more and more we see that here with yes. his own show even solar opposites has some heart to it this does not once again to reiterate from our last discussion this is his first show he's done on his own and it's lacking human qualities mm -hmm. it's lacking the reason why we care it's lacking connection it's lacking reasons why we should continue to watch these characters on screen and the thing is, the sad, the frustrating part for me in this, uh, with this episode is you see how Captain Freeman is and it's, you could tell that the writers are trying to say, here's the reason why Mariner is the way she is. It's, it's right in mom. front of us. It's right it's in, front, right of in us. front of us. But unfortunately, if you guys aren't actually, if you guys are trying to use it subtly, all you're doing in this episode is making Mariner look like a spoiled little child. That's it. That doesn't make her very redeeming. Yeah. It's kind of sad, honestly. Because she's a dude I like. 
Like Boilermer was interesting in this episode. Yeah, he was. Boilermer was in the last episode. It was Rutherford. Mariner is definitely considered on paper the lead, and yet she is just obnoxious. I just want to. I just want to stab her in the face. Yeah. <laughs> I hope we continue to get moments like we did in this episode where we were brought into the concept of the buffer time. I will say that that was cool. That was cool. Taking us kind of essentially what the entire concept of Lower Decks was supposed to be about, which yeah. is seeing the crew and how they think and their process, not the, the standard command crew mentality. The concept of this entire episode playing into Scotty's entire stick of how to make yourself appear to be a miracle worker I thought was fucking fantastic. Yeah. Tell them it's going to take five hours, even if it's just going to take an hour Hour. because then you look like a superstar. I love that. That's classic Scotty 101. In fact, I believe it all started when Scotty made a remark in the search for Spock about how he always had had his repair estimates in order to maintain his reputation as a miracle worker. Yes. And then that became the book on Scotty. And then I believe he even used it in the TNG cameo. He had when he told LaForge that he shouldn't have told Picard an accurate repair estimate. Yes. Yeah. And I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> yeah. So I like that they made it. A, they essentially use that concept as a bit of a, a platform yeah, or a foundation for this episode. That's the type of things I signed up for yeah, in this show. Because, because doing that, it makes us understand this crew of this series it makes us understand the crew of the Cerritos. 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 The Cerritos. The Cerritos. The Cerritos. <laughs> but it makes us understand that crew and it gives them the crew itself its own personality because every single Star Trek series, if you look at it, every single crew has their one unifying personality. TOS is basically like almost like swashbucklers. They just go around, they're explorers, they're they're constantly, you know, drinking. You picture them like What show were you watching? They're constantly drinking. Well, you, you picture you picture basically Were you watching like, the Star Trek porn? <laughs> well, yeah, I have. But you picture like the crew of Kirk, Spock, and McCoy. I get kind of what like, you're saying. I'm giving you shit. Yeah. <laughs> like swashbucklers. Yeah, I get it. Then you go to the TNG and it's more like this is the Utopia crew. Right. Yep. And then you go to DS9 and it's basically this is the fucked up. <laughs> We're stuck in war crew. Yeah. And then you go to Voyager. It's like they're like the old Greek heroes. Mm-hmm. The, the ones that are lost in in at sea, lost in space. Right. Everything else. They're on this endless journey. The endless journey. Yeah. With Lower Decks, I was waiting for something like this to happen. And it's one of the brighter moments in episode three that even though I'm not too keen on this episode, it's one of the pros of this episode that I wrote down is like, we're finally getting to see what this crew is like. They're laid back. They're, they're basically the lower ranking misfits. Not a lot of, not a lot of expectations. Yeah. There's not a lot of expectations, but they have like this grandiose uh, perception of themselves. Perception of themselves. And it, uh, that leads to honestly, one of, my favorite points, which is uh, Commander Ransom. Commander Ransom's hilarious. Yeah. He is like. He's one of my favorites so far. He's Captain Kirk ramped up to 11. 11. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because of my well, favorite dude, one. Even in this episode, he fought like Captain Kirk he, with, he with, like the, Captain, uh, with the fists. With the fists. Where you ball them up and you use them as one. <laughs> I kept cracking up when, when, he, when he ran into the fight and he goes, no, I don't need this. I just need my fists. And then he rips off his shirt. And then that's when, that's when we start actually it's the only moment in the episode where Mariner starts getting interesting because she's like, going, oh, wow, this is hot. And I'm like going, there you go. I know nowadays a lot of liberals don't want the, the relationship connection because it takes away from the woman's importance, they feel. But honestly, if they were to go down that route, it would make it pretty interesting. It would. To see that you have these two people who kind of despise each other. <laughs> And they both have a thing for each other at the same time. The same There's time. a little bit of sexual tension. Honestly, that would make 
Mariner a little more interesting. A little more interesting and a little bit more palatable. Because yeah. at least then she has like this quote unquote chink in her armor where she's not so perfect. I, she I, she um, she she we gets need weakened by Dave, ransom. We need something. Yeah, we need something. We need something. something for her because it's it's not working so far. We have seven episodes left in the first season, so there there is some time. If we don't get there within the next two or ep- two or three episodes, then I think we can shrug it off and say, "Well, I guess that's the season. We're not going to, you know, make <laughs> Mariner that much better." I feel like the most interesting part of this episode, Dave, was the ending <laughs> at the very end of the episode. At the very end of the episode, we saw what apparently is going to be or is the legacy of Chief Chief Miles Miles (laughs) O'Brien. So he's destined to become the most important person in Starfleet history. Did I miss something? (laughs) Apparently I missed something. But this is Star Trek canon, by the way. Yes. So... That had me raising something eyebrow happened too. during D Space Nine season eight, eight <laughs> <laughs> that we are not privy to yet. That's what I'm like going. That's that's one of those the jokes that I I'm left really confused about the series. Are they trying to parody themselves? Oh yeah, absolutely, Dave. Don't be confused about that. You and, know it. And like I'm like, but I'm supposed to take this seriously. That Miles O'Brien is the most important man. I mean, listen, yeah, O'Brien's amazing. As which, long as Keiko can stay out of his way, he would be, he'd be great. Which if, if this, if this is canon, true canon, what would you do if Discovery season three actually makes <laughs> Okay. So there were some articles that were put out saying, is this an Easter egg for Discovery, Discovery season, season three? three? Are they going to also explore this whole Miles O'Brien aspect? <laughs> now, if they do it in a, in a clever nonchalant way and they don't draw a lot of attention to it that O'Brien had accomplished something at the tail end of his life something then I would applaud I'd be like okay this is cool (laughs) this is cool yeah so we'll see we'll see all right Dave so this does bring us to the end of our discussion this episode why don't you give me your final thoughts as well as your RMD score final thoughts and my score for this one It's not my favorite episode out of the three episodes we've had so far. Um, The, the jokes did not land in my opinion. When I looked at, when I look, when I watched this a second time, I was like going, do the jokes land or am I just laughing at it because it's Star Trek? And I've actually said, I'm just laughing at this because it's Star Trek. The jokes are not legitimately landing. Your timing with your comedy is not hitting. And especially with Mariner, that I understand what they're trying to do with her now, but it's just not hitting. It's not hitting at all. You, in fact, you're making this character look totally unredeemable. So I'm hoping by episode four, just like we said, episode four, episode to episode six, we see something that gives us a reason to care about her because I do, I want to, she's the last one of the crew that I basically uh, wrote down on my notes. I was like, Mariner's the only one that basically I, I I actually despise right now. She's the only one we don't care about. Yeah. I want her to get stabbed in the face. The cat doctor is interesting. The The captain's interesting. Ransom is interesting. The security officer is interesting. Rutherford is interesting. Boilermer is interesting. Mariner sucks. Sucks. And I'm like going, you could, you have a lot of potential with this character. You just have to really, really execute it perfectly. And so with that said, my score for Lower Decks episode three is a 73. Okay. You look very ashamed of yourself right now in video. Well, because I really want you really do. Your face looked like, is it okay, guys? Is that okay? okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm a good boy. I promise. I know, I know out there a lot of people don't want to like Lower Decks. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think it's hip and trendy to hate on Star Trek yeah, right now. But honestly, we need some good Star Trek. We do need it. You are right. <laughs> and I. it is a lot of people do just want to hate on Star Trek right now. And 
justifiably so. I get their hate, but at the same time, I feel like a lot of them are not as objective as I as they think they are. I think a lot of them are a little overly passionate. That's not to say there aren't problems with this current Alex Kurtzman era of Trek. There absolutely are problems. There are problems. Without a doubt. But that doesn't mean there aren't some some moments of gold throughout. <laughs> Season 2 of Discovery was pretty fucking great. Lower Decks is struggling. I'll be honest. I'm going to give this an RMD score of 63%. So it is a step up for me. It's better than the last episode in some regards, and it's also worse, worse in some regards. But ultimately, at the end of the day, this gets a better score for me because of the one percent trek that they brought. Yeah. It felt like there was a purpose that they were trying to say something immense, all the chaos. And I agree with you, Dave. That the laughs are not clicking. It feels forced. This is a comedy. And it's just not funny. Yeah. There were moments in the previous episode where I laughed. The the stuff was Rutherford was funny. The Rutherford stuff is gold. But this episode, you're dealing with a comedy. You should chuckle. You should smile. You should grin. And I'm not doing any of those things. And I just keep asking myself, why are we here right now? (laughs) Why are we doing this? Okay, so you want to do a Star Trek comedy. Great. Make me laugh. That's all you got to do. Okay, so you're not so funny, but you're you're, you're a decent Star Trek series. No, you're not. This doesn't even really feel like Star Trek. If this wasn't Star Trek, if this wasn't dressed up in Star Trek dressing... I probably wouldn't be watching this. I would have checked out after the first episode. Mm -hmm. The only reason why I'm continuing to watch this is because of the Star Trek packaging. I'm hoping it fixes itself because as of right now, I just don't understand what we're doing here. Why is this titled Star Trek? Why is it titled a Star Trek comedy? It's not Star Trek and it's not funny. Yeah. So you're not accomplishing any of the things you sought out to be at least be one. Yeah. And it's really frustrating when you think about it is like the only thing that really does feel like Star Trek is its theme song. Uh, (laughs) The greatest moment of every episode. (laughs) That's pretty much it. And I don't want, as I said in our last discussion, I don't want to be negative. I don't want, I don't want to be overly toxic. I just want, I Dave, I want to treat Star Trek like a hot chick. I just want to make love to it. I want to feel on the boobs. And wanna, you want to brag. I want to play with the ass. Yes. You wanna brag. I want to brag and tell my buddies. I'm like, guess what? This chick is hot. And I was, I was up in it last night. I want to do that with Star Trek. I'm like, bro, did you just watch that fucking episode? <laughs> you don't want to basically just hide in the corner and basically go. Yeah. I don't want to cuckold myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah I, I'm scared, man. I am. I am too, because like, I want this to be good. I want to be a fan. I really fucking do, dude. Everyone, everyone, all the critics have stated, and it's because they saw four episodes. They said, okay, oh, after I, the fourth episode, I guess they said, we'll see. oh, this is good Star Trek. I'm like, okay, we're at episode three and pretty much the series is meandering. <laughs> Yeah. We'll see, Dave, right? We have one more episode to see what they saw. Mariner dies. Oh. <laughs> Mariner dies. A plus. <laughs> All right, we'll see. This does bring us to the end of our discussion. I want to thank everyone for listening. Thank you, David. Thank you. Live long and prosper. That Mariner. Oh. I wanted to get stabbed by ransom. <laughs> wow, that is very fucking aggressive. I couldn't help but notice your pain. My pain. It runs deep. Share it with me. End simulation.